Okay. Uh, I hope that this is set up properly. It should be. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, if you're watching this and you're from my class, this is a video that's meant to help you with the concept of uh, nomenclature and chemical formulas related to ionic compounds um, that have both multivalent metals as well as polyatomic ions in them. And I figured I would just take a moment to uh, work through a bunch of problems where um, we've set in stone all of these problems and, and you have them as a resource for you to use. So I'm just going to kind of jump in right away um, to make sure that your time is uh, is used properly here. And we're going to start up here up at the top. So I've got this chart and this is a set of mixed problems related to ionic compounds. Across the top of the chart we have things like the type of ionic compound, the name of the positive and negative ion, the formula of the positive and negative ion, the chemical formula of that um, particular ionic compound, and then the name of the ionic compound. Uh, so in this case, we're told only select pieces of information. We're told that um, this is a calcium ion, right? And a chloride ion. Uh, in this case, if I wanted to write the formula for a calcium ion, um, and I'm unsure about how to find that charge, I would look at a periodic table Okay, so in this case, calcium is right here. It is in group two of the periodic table. It's an alkaline earth metal. And its oxidation state, or the type of ion that it typically forms, is positive two. And that makes a lot of sense because it has two valence electrons. So it's willing to lose those two electrons. Uh, so in this case, the formula of that positive ion would be calcium and then two plus. Um, let's see if I can write it maybe a little bit cleaner there. Okay, calcium 2 plus. We use the, the, the superscript, the exponent spot of that formula uh, for the charge. Uh, the formula for the negative ion here, well, we're told it's a chloride ion, right? Um, so if we look at the periodic table once again, and we look at chlorine, which is in group 17 on the far right-hand side of the table, uh, chlorine is a halogen, which means that it can typically form um, a lot of different ions. But in this case, because it's bonding with a metal, we're going to take that negative one oxidation state. Um, so we're going to write chlorine negative one. Uh, when these two form a chemical compound, if we were to do our crisscross method, so if I just zoom off to the side here, and we utilize that crisscross method for calcium and chlorine, we start by writing out our two ion formulas, and we do our crisscross, and we're left with something that looks like this, uh, where we have one calcium and two chlorine in the molecular formula, and we can kind of just simplify this so that it's CaCl2. So where it says chemical formula, we're going to write CaCl2. Uh, if we wanted to name this, we would call this calcium chloride. Um, and then because calcium is a metal that only ever has one charge, so it's not a multivalent metal, it can't form uh, more than one valence. Uh, this is a simple ionic compound. So right here where it says type of ionic compound, I'm just going to write simple ionic. That way we differentiate between um, polyatomic and multivalent ionic compounds. Uh, in the next question, we're given information about how we have an iron 3 ion and a phosphide ion. Uh, so in this case, the iron 3, so um, th this is a multivalent metal. The Roman numerals indicate the charge that iron is taking. Uh, we're going to write Fe. That's the symbol for iron. And they've told us that it's the 3 plus version of that ion. 
Uh, we're also told that phosphide is the negative ion. So in this case, it's P. Uh, phosphorus's position on the periodic table is in group 15. It's right here. Uh, it typically takes the oxidation state of negative 3, especially when it's bonding with a metal. So in this case, we're going to use the negative 3 charge. Uh, if we wanted to write the chemical formula, we would do our crisscross. So I'll move back over here to the side. And I will erase all of this stuff down here. Um, we have iron with a positive 3 charge, and we have a phosphide ion with a negative 3 charge. If we do our crisscross, we end up with something that looks like this, Fe3, P3. And we know that we can reduce chemical formulas to their lowest common factor um, by dividing out a number. So in this case, we could simplify this to just FEP because those threes are common and they can divide out. So in this case, uh, we would say that the chemical formula of this particular compound is FEP. Uh, if we wanted to name this, we would start with the name of the metal. So in this case, it would be iron. Uh, in the name, because we're using a multivalent metal, we are going to use Roman numerals to indicate, um, we're gonna indicate that we've used the three plus ion and with all ionic compounds, we always end with phosphide. We end by changing the name of the nonmetal to IDE. So rather than saying iron 3 phosphorus, we say iron 3 phosphide. Uh, the type of ionic compound here um, above me is a multivalent ionic compound. Hi, Laura. Uh, it's multivalent because the iron in this case is capable of taking charges of plus two and plus three. So because of the fact that our, our metal cation uh, has more than one possible charge, this is a multivalent compound. Uh, if we move down to the next one, so I'm just going to zoom out here and I'm going to remove this real quick. Why did that not go away? There we go. Um, in this case, we have a different set of information, right? The They've told us the sodium cation, and they've told us that the anion here is sulfide. So if we wanted to name them and start over here, we could just say that this is a sodium ion, right? When we, when we name cations, we just say the name of the metal and we finish with ion. Uh, in the case of our our anion, uh, which is S2 minus, we're gonna call this a sulfide ion. So just like how in ionic compounds, when we change the name from um, non-metal to non-metal plus IDE, we do the same thing for ions. Uh, if we wanted to do the chemical formula for sodium, and sulfur coming together, we would have to write out their charges. So in this case, sodium is a plus one, sulfur is a two minus, and we do our crisscross. Uh, sodium is going to have a subscript of two and sulfur a subscript of one, which when we simplify that, we get something that looks like this, which is Na2S. And we can write that chemical formula up here where it says chemical formula in Na2S. Uh, the name of this compound um, does not involve Roman numerals because sodium is only ever able, capable of uh, taking one charge, right? It's an alkali metal. So in this case, we say sodium sulfide. And if we wanted to identify the type of ionic compound that this is, we would say that this is a simple, a simple ionic compound.
okay? Uh, in the fourth example there, they give us aluminum and bromine. So aluminum is an example of a metal that, again, only has one charge. So we're dealing with a simple ionic compound once again, if we want to go from left to right. We would call it an aluminum ion. Uh, the bromine, we would change its ending to IDE. This becomes a bromide ion. Uh, if we wanted to do our crisscross for the aluminum cation and the bromine anion, uh, we would take aluminum, which is a 3 plus, bromine, which is a 1 minus, and do the crisscross. In this case, we're left with something that looks like this. So Al1Br3. We can simplify this by just saying AlBr3. We don't need to worry about the 1. So over here on the right-hand side in our table, we can write AlBr3. And if we want to name it, we can just call this aluminum bromide. Aluminum bromide. Metal first, non-metal second. We change the ending to IDE. Um, in that next example, they don't give us any information aside from the name of the chemical compound. So in this case, they say that it's lithium sulfide, um, which means that we have to kind of reverse engineer the name into its ions as well as its chemical formula. So if, if I write the name of the chemical formula, which is lithium sulfide, and I'll write that up top, uh, I'm going to start by writing out their ions. So in this case, lithium is a one plus ion and sulfur or sulfide is a two minus anion. Uh, if I crisscross these, I get something that looks like this, Li2S, and I'm gonna omit the one now, now that we've worked through enough examples here. Uh, we don't have to write the one, we can omit that one. So based off of this information, well, lithium only has one charge. So in that case, I'm just going to call this simple ionic. Uh, a lithium ion is just called a lithium ion. A sulfur ion is called a sulfide ion. Lithium forms an ion that looks like this, the one plus. Uh, the sulfide ion is S2 minus. That chemical formula that we devised up here above my above my head is Li2S and that was a result of the crisscross that we did with the cation and the anion. So that solves the conundrum of lithium sulfide given to us with just its chemical name. If we move down, uh, the next one is gold 3 oxide. Um, so because they've used a Roman numeral here, they're indicating to us that gold is a multivalent metal. So right away, without even having to do anything, I can say that this compound is a multivalent ionic compound. Um, in this case, the name of the positive ion is going to be a gold ion. The name of the negative ion, okay, so in this case, the ending of this name over here on the right-hand side is oxide, which means that this is going to be an oxide ion. Okay, it comes from oxygen. We've changed the name from oxygen to oxide. Uh, the formula of the positive ion here, the nice part about the multivalent metals, when you're given the name, rather than the formula and having to work backwards to figure out which ion you've been given, because they've written gold three in the, in the chemical formula, they're telling us that this is the gold three plus cation. And gold has the chemical symbol uh, of AU. I guess the other oxidation state of gold is positive one, but in this case, we're using the positive three one. Oxygen normally forms a, an anion that has a negative two charge. 
So if we wanted to figure out what the chemical formula for these two ions, okay, we use our crisscross method. In this case, the two from the oxygen comes down into the subscript position for gold. And the three in the superscript position comes down into the subscript position for oxygen. So our chemical formula there is AU2O3. And I mean, this makes sense, right? Ionic compounds are neutral. They don't have a charge. So what we're saying here is that for the two golds that are in that molecular structure, each of them has a positive three charge. That nets us a total positive charge of plus six. And we're also saying that because there's three oxygens that each have a negative two, well, three times negative two is negative six. And our positive six and negative six end up balancing out. Uh, and this ionic compound is electrically neutral, which is awesome. Because that's the whole point of us using that crisscross method, right? So that formula is Au2O3. Okay, and that is our that's our chemical formula for gold gold three oxide. Uh, moving down to that next one, okay, as as I quickly try to uh, scrub away. the work up here. Um, we're told that we have a magnesium ion and a carbonate ion. Um, carbonate is a polyatomic ion. So if I pull up um, a polyatomic ion chart, uh, carbonate is up here. The chemical formula of a carbonate ion is CO3 2 minus which means we have one carbon bonded to three oxygens acting as a single unit and they carry a collective charge of negative two. So right away, seeing carbonate, I can call this a polyatomic ionic compound. Okay, it has a polyatomic ion in it. Um, if I wanted to write the formula for the magnesium ion, the positive cation. Um, magnesium on the periodic table, when I pull that up, is in group two. This is an alkaline earth metal. Its typical oxidation state is plus two. Like it likes to lose those two electrons so that it can be like the noble gas neon. Uh, so in this case, its cation formula is going to be Mg2 plus. Uh, the carbonate ion, which is CO3 2 minus, is going to go next to the magnesium cation. And when I write the chemical formula for this, I can, I can still use my crisscross method. I still want to use the crisscross method to help simplify the mathematics here. So we have magnesium with a 2 plus charge. We have carbonate with a 2 minus charge. And when I do my crisscross... I end up with something that looks like this. Mg2, I'm gonna open up a set of brackets, CO3, two, right? The, the two from the magnesium's ion comes down to the carbonate. The two from the carbonate's ion comes down to the magnesium. And because these two share a common factor of two, I can divide that two out, right? So in this case, we're left with something that looks like this, MgCO3. And our chemical formula, which we can write over here, is MgCO3. Now, when we name when, when we name a polyatomic ionic compound, we start by writing the name of the metal. So in this case, it's magnesium. And we end we end this compound uh, by writing carbonate. Okay, we write the name of the polyatomic ion. We don't change anything. We don't have to change the ending to IDE. We can just we can just say magnesium carbonate, and we're all good. Okay. Um, in this next example, which is the one below that, um, as I erase all of this stuff or try to very quickly, we have the formula of a positive cation, calcium. 
and the formula of the negative ion, NO3. So you have a nitrogen bonded to three oxygens and they collectively carry a negative one charge. Well, if I look at my polyatomic ion chart, nitrate is a polyatomic ion, right? NO3 is on that chart. So right away, I know that this chemical compound is polyatomic ionic. The name of that positive ion is a calcium ion. Uh, we just looked up what the name of NO3 is. Okay, this is a nitrate ion. If I want to find the chemical formula by doing our crisscross method for calcium and nitrate, well, I can write out calcium's ion and nitrate's ion. We can do our crisscross. The one from the calcium, or sorry, the one from the nitrate will come down, attach itself to the subscript position of calcium. And for nitrate, we have a subscript of two. That positive two from the calcium comes down. Uh, I can simplify this a little bit further by kind of getting rid of that one. Okay, we don't need to write the one. But we do need to keep those brackets there to indicate that in order for this to be electrically neutral, um, we need two nitrates there because each of those nitrates has a negative one charge and the calcium itself has a positive two charge. So one calcium is balanced uh, electrically by two nitrates. So if I wanted to write the chemical formula for that, I can write Ca NO32. And if I wanted to name this, I could say that this is calcium nitrate, right? When we name a polyatomic ionic compound, we write the name of the metal, the name of the polyatomic ion, and we don't change the ending. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, the, next, the next row here in this chart um, includes a question that it's probably the, the hardest, hardest type of question involved with ionic compounds. And it's when you are given the chemical formula and you have to reverse engineer the name for it. Um, in this case, we're told that the chemical formula is HGS. So as a heads up, um, well, we know that S is a sulfide ion. Okay, so we can, and, and just thinking back and looking back to some of the previous examples we've done, sulfide is two minus. HG is mercury. Now, mercury, if we look at a periodic table right here, is a multivalent metal. It has more than one charge. That can be a plus two or a plus one. And we don't know which one it is, but we have to kind of problem solve and figure out, well, based off of what the information we're given, is it, is it the plus two or is it the plus one? So taking its chemical formula, okay, in, in the chart we're told that the chemical formula is HGS. If we write that formula out, and then we take this compound and we break it up into its ions. So now we're doing the reverse crisscross method. We know that this is gonna become some kind of mercury cation. This is gonna become some kind of sulfide anion. The thing is though, we know what the charge of sulfide is. The charge of sulfide is always two minus, that doesn't change. So it's really weird that this chemical formula down here doesn't have a two next to the mercury because if the sulfur's ionic charge was crossed down, there should be a two there. The only possible way for that two to not be there is if it was canceled out. And earlier we've used, or we've, we've looked over some examples where 
we can divide out um, subscripts based off of common factors. So just to play around with the idea, if this mercury had a charge of two plus, and then you did your crisscross, the two from the mercury and the two from the sulfur, they would cancel out. And you would be left with a chemical formula like HGS. Now, the reason why this is important is because in this table, we're being asked for things like the name of the positive ion. So right here, we're gonna indicate that the only way for that formula to be HGS is if this is the mercury two ion. And the chemical formula of that would be HG2 plus. When you name a, an ionic compound that has a multivalent metal in it, so first of all, I, you know, I can go back here and I can say this is a multivalent ionic compound. When you name an ionic compound that has a multivalent metal, um, you have to indicate the Roman numerals that apply to that charge, that the charge on that metal. So in this case, we're going to name this mercury 2, and we end the same way that we always have. We're going to say mercury 2 sulfide. So this is one of those tricky ones where in order for us to figure out what that charge was, uh, we had to think about an intermediary step where that chemical compound actually looked like this, right? If those charges were crossed down, it would look like Hg2S2, but they got canceled out. And that's why that resultant chemical formula is HGS. So that indicates to us that it has to be the two plus cation. Um, another way of possibly showing this is if we were to take um, the mercury's X plus charge that we don't know, and we were to add it to sulfur's two minus charge. Okay, and there's only one of, the, one of each of them in the formula down here that I've circled. And I was to make those equivalent to zero. I'm, I'm effectively creating a little bit of an algebraic statement, right? I'm saying that X plus negative two is equal to zero. And the only way for that to equal zero is if X is the opposite integer, which in this case is positive two, right? Positive two plus negative two would be zero. So this is, th this is where the problem solving aspect of chemical compounds and understanding like why we can do the crisscross method and where it comes from and what its uses are like that's that's the true value of of the, this process is you're going to run into examples where um you're given a multivalent metal and you have to reverse engineer which cation is being used to make the formula um in the next one we have hg3po42 so in this case not only are we dealing with mercury again, but now we're also including a polyatomic ion. So right off the bat, I'm gonna say that this is multivalent. Polyatomic. And we run into the situation again where we have, based off of its chemical formula, we have to, we have to go backwards into the ions and figure out, well, what charge of merc mercury was used here. So if we take this, this formula that they gave us, which was, I believe it was Hg3PO42, and we cross it back up into its ions, right? We have Hg, which is X plus. We, we don't know what the charge of mercury is, uh, but we do know that phosphate, okay, that's that, that's that, that polyatomic ion. If we look at our chart over here, okay, phosphate, it always has that negative three charge, always. So this negative three is 
responsible for putting a 3 next to the Mercury. The only way for this crisscross to, ha to have worked was if this 2, which is on the outside of the brackets of the PO4, was that, that cation charge up there. So in, in this case, the only charge that could work for this particular chemical formula is once again that mercury 2 ion. Uh, in this case, we also have a phosphate ion. Once again, we have mercury 2 plus. Our phosphate ion is PO4 3 minus. And if I wanted to name this, okay, it's a multivalent polyatomic ionic compound. We would have to say that this is mercury 2 phosphate. So we write the name of the metal, we indicate the charge of the metal using Roman numerals, and then we also write the name of the polyatomic ion without changing the ending or the, the, the name at the end. And yes, Laura, I am using the funky pen. I am using the funky pen to complete this. Uh, in the next one, okay, as I zoom out here and I try to erase all of these, in the next one, it looks like we're dealing with um, two polyatomic ions. So in this case, they told, they've they told us that the name of the negative ion is acetate, and the formula for the positive ion is NH4 one plus. So I already know, um, but if I was to look at a polyatomic ion chart, and I look right up at the top, Ammonium is the only polyatomic ion that has a positive charge. So this name, the name of this positive positive cation is an ammonium ion. And if I look at this chart and I try to find acetate, there are two chemical formulas here for acetate. They're the same thing. They're just written in slightly different ways, right? Like if you count, if we zoom in a bit and you count, well, there's a carbon here and a carbon here. And the other formula is saying C2, right? There's a there's three hydrogens, three hydrogens. There's two oxygens right next to each other. There's two right here. There's just two different ways of writing acetate. And in this case, it doesn't really matter which one we choose. Um, I'll probably pick the bottom one, so C2H3O2, uh, and we can write that in our chart. So this is C2H3O2, and it has a negative one charge. If I wanted to find the chemical formula of this mess of letters and numbers, I just have to use my crisscross rule. The crisscross rule, like I've always used it, Right, I start with my positive cation, which is NH4 one plus. I'm gonna take acetate, C2H3O2, one minus. I'm gonna do my crisscross. And in this case, I have one NH4. And one acetate. And I don't actually need those ones there, I've only put the ones there to show you that there's one of each ion to balance out the ionic charge in this compound. When you write this, you can just write NH4 C2H3O2. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a very long uh, chemical form. It's probably the longest one we've seen so far. So this is NH4 C2H3O2. It's kind of messy. I'll try my best to fix it, right? NH4C2H3O2. And if I wanted to name this, I would call this ammonium acetate. 
So in order to name this, we just have to say that the, the two names of the polyatomic ions that are involved in um, in this chemical compounds formula, right? Ammonium and acetate. We've got a few more here. So uh, in number 12, we have tin for chromate. So if I erase over here, Um, in this case, they've, they've done us the favor of giving us the chemical name. They've told us it's tin for chromate. So tin, its chemical symbol is SN. And because the, because the name said tin for, we know that we're dealing with the four plus version of tin. Now, Chromate is a polyatomic ion. Uh, when I pull it up on my polyatomic ion chart, uh, I have CrO4 2 minus. CrO4 2 minus. So if I wanted to do my crisscross here, CrO4 2 minus, right? I treat it just like it's an ionic compound. We do our crisscross. And we're left with SN2, that two comes down from the chromate. And I need to open up a set of brackets because I'm about to put a four all the way over from the tin next to the chromate, right? I don't want it to say CrO44, indicating that there's a one chromate, uh, one chromium atom bonded to 44 oxygens. Uh, but in order to kind of help break this down slightly, we can actually reduce here, right? We have subscripts of two and four. So the lowest common factor between those two, sorry, I should say the greatest common factor is two. I can, I can just divide both of them by two. And I, I get this, uh, SN, CRO4, two. So the two has been completely removed um, and the four, subscript of four has been brought down to a two. So based off of this, uh, we should be able to fill in the rest of this, this table here. I totally forgot to, to fill in this up here, just polyatomic ionic. Um, in this case, uh, this particular example is not only using a multivalent metal, but it's using a polyatomic ion. So once again, I'm going to call this multivalent, polyatomic. Uh, our positive ion was a tin four ion. The negative ion uh, was chromate. So I'm just gonna say it was a chromate ion. I don't have to change the ending. Remember it's polyatomic, so we don't have to deal with that. Uh, our symbol for tin was SN. So in this case, it would be SN4 plus. Uh, chromate was CrO4 two minus. And when we did our crisscross, we ended up with a chemical formula that looked like this. SN and then in brackets, CrO4 two. Uh, in the next one, we have rubidium, a rubidium ion and sulfate. So let's get rid of, uh, let's get rid of this stuff up here. When it goes over the PDF, it doesn't like to erase properly. There we go. So rubidium is an element that you don't really see very often. Um, if we look at our periodic table, uh, rubidium is an alkali metal. So just like potassium and sodium and lithium, its oxidation state is plus one. It likes to lose an electron. So if we were to write the chemical formula of rubidium or its element or its ion symbol, we would write Rb1+. Uh, we're also dealing with sulfate. So sulfate is a polyatomic ion. Right, if we look at our polyatomic ion chart, sulfate is down here. 
It's the one that got kind of non-centered for whatever reason on this chart. Uh, it's SO4 2 minus. So in this case, we can write SO4 2 minus. I can also say that this is a polyatomic ionic compound. And if I wanted to write the chemical formula here, I won't do the crisscross because um, it should be pretty straightforward. My, the rubidium's one plus will go down to the sulfate and the two minus from the sulfate will go down to the rubidium. And we're left with something that looks like this. Rb2SO4. All right, there's one sulfate bonded to two separate rubidium in order to electrically neutralize the charge of this ionic compound. And when we name this, we can just say that it is rubidium sulfate. Uh, in the next one, which is the one right below that, again, we get, we get kind of lucky here with some of these, these examples, like PB is lead, right? Uh, if I pull up a periodic table, lead is right down here. Lead is one of those transition metals. Okay, its oxidation states are typically plus four or plus two. But we got lucky. They told, they told us the charge, right? It's plus four. So in this case, I can say that this is a lead four ion. Uh, this right here, OH minus one, this is a polyatomic ion. This is actually called hydroxide. So this is a hydroxide ion. Um, this is not only using a multivalent metal, this is also using a polyatomic ion, right? So I can say that this is multivalent polyatomic. Terrible writing. Uh, when I do my crisscross, in this case, the one from the hydroxide is going to go to the lead. So I don't, I don't, I can just omit the one. I don't need to include the one. Um, the four is going to go down to the hydroxide. So for this OH, I need to open up a set of brackets and I need to write a four. When I name uh, a multivalent ionic compound, I need to include the Roman numerals because I'm using a cation that has more than one charge. And I need to tell people what, what the charge is. So in this case, I'm going to call this lead for hydroxide. Okay, lead for hydroxide. We got two left on the home stretch. Uh, in this case, uh, for number 15, we have manganese for acetate. Manganese for acetate. Manganese is another one of those um, transition metals. Okay, it has a lot of different oxidation states. The one that we're using here is number four because they've told us in the chemical formula or in the chemical compounds name, it's manganese for, ox for, for acetate. So right off the bat, we know this is MN4+. Uh, we dealt with acetate earlier. Acetate is that one at C2H3O2, one minus. In this case, um, this is a, once again, multivalent polyatomic ionic compound. We're using the manganese for ion, and we're also using an acetate ion. Okay, I know my writing's not the best, but give me a break. I'm confined to a really small space here. And we're just gonna do our crisscross, right? So the negative one from the acetate is gonna come down to the manganese. So we're left with MN, and the positive four is gonna go down to the acetate. So I need to open up a set of brackets, and I'm gonna try and fit this in. C2H3O2, close the brackets, and a four. Right, way down there, that is our manganese four acetate. There are four acetates bonded to the manganese because each of those acetates has a charge of negative one. The manganese has a charge of plus four. So in order to balance that and have a, a charge of 
zero for our ionic compound, we need to make sure that they're balanced out with our crisscross method. We have arrived. We've arrived at the last one. Looks like it's a spelling error. Because in this one, we're told IO3 1 minus. And we're also told that this is a sodium ion. I think this is a, this is a, this is an error in the sheet. Um, oh wait, no, I'm wrong. IO3 1 minus is a polyatomic ion. This is iodate. I'm pretty sure. Where is it? There's perio date. Where's iodate? There it is up top. IO3 minus. Okay, so first of all, we can conclude, and we almost jumped the gun there and said, oh, spelling mistake. Oh, it's an error. Not quite. This is a polyatomic. compound. Um, we know that the sodium is a 1 plus. Sodium is always 1 plus. Uh, this is an iodate ion. Iodate. And if I do my crisscross, well, they, they're both they're both 1, right? Sodium is plus 1. Iodate is negative 1. So if I, if I do my crisscross, I get left with something that looks like this. That three comes from the fact that the iodate ion is one iodine atom bonded to three oxygens. If I wanted to name this, I could say that this is just sodium iodate. And there you have it. 16 different examples of mixed practice related to simple ionic, Multivalent ionic, polyatomic ionic. There are even examples in there of multivalent polyatomic ionic compounds, right? Transition metals mixed with polyatomic ions. That's crazy. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I hope that this is potentially helpful to you in class. Uh, I wish you good luck with chemistry, nomenclature, and writing chemical formulas. And I will catch you next time on Discourse with Thompson. Have a wonderful day, evening, or night.